So, very well, welcome to everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed your lunch and refreshed yourselves a bit so we have the energy to follow uh, <clears throat> this session and uh, thanks for joining. Uh, this session is going to be mostly about the domain which is kind of new for our industry. It's the domain of IoT and home routers, hacking and infecting them. Uh, but before we actually get there, we could, because that's the two following talks, the first case we have here is an interesting piece of research uh, by the ESET researchers on uh, targeted attacks, uh, industry espionage, high-profile targets, and this kind of stuff. So this is kind of hot news uh, for ages already, I could say. So without any further ado, please welcome Anton Cherepano and Robert Lipowski on Operation Potato Express. Hello, everyone. Uh, so last year, we were on this stage, well, not this stage, but uh, the one in Seattle talking about an APT called Black Energy. That's the one that you might remember uh, received quite a lot of public attention under the name Sandworm. Uh, well, today we'll talk about another malware family used for cyber espionage. Uh, now, we have quite a lot of interesting content, so I don't want to bore you with a boring introduction, so let's get right to it. Potau Express, what the hell does that mean? Well, Potau, uh, is the first part, Potao comes from the name of the malware. Express comes from one of the spreading campaigns, which I'll talk about in just a second. The malware itself is not new. In fact, it has been around since at least 2011, yet it hasn't received much, um, much public attention until now. Here are the parts of the code which contain uh, the PDB uh, file paths. Uh, which contain the strings potau or sapotau or also node 69. So if you ever read about uh, or encounter malware uh, with these names, then we're talking about the same thing. The country is mostly targeted or the highest number of victims were mostly in Ukraine, just like Black Energy, which we already talked about, uh, and also Russia, Belarus, and Georgia. So let's start talking about uh, the individual timeline uh, of the attacks. When we were monitoring uh, and tracking, tracking all the different samples, we uh, were able to uh, follow the evolution of the malware. Uh, the version number of the malware is pretty, pretty clearly labeled uh, within the sample. Uh, also, the samples contain a unique uh, campaign identifier uh, which also enables us to track uh, the individual targeted campaigns. And uh, all the samples were basically tailored uh, for particular victims. Now, most of these campaign IDs uh, are just a bunch of letters which we were not able to decipher, although some of them uh, probably have some significance according to uh, who the target was. Now, as you can see, there's quite a lot of them uh, in, this, in this timeline. Most probably there are also some of them which we, which we haven't uh, haven't seen, which were out there. Uh, but we put together this uh, timeline of the most interesting, most notable events. So uh, let's talk about those uh, and fo focus on them. So th as I mentioned, uh, the malware has been around since at least 2011, and the first appearance where we spotted it was in May 2011. Uh, that time, it was a mass spreading campaign. It wasn't, it wasn't particularly uh, limited targeting. Uh, the malware contained an encrypted string global portal, hence, hence the detection name. And the spreading mechanism for this was a pretty, pretty typical one. Uh, nothing, nothing too innovative uh, for this one. So it was basically executables, uh, which used uh, an icon of Microsoft Word document. Uh, of course, when somebody clicks on a, on a uh, document which is or, or a file which is masquerading as a word document they're also expecting to see see a uh, word document opening up uh, and for that reason uh, to cover its tracks to appear more innocuous so the malware contained uh, an embedded uh, decoy document within or at least most of the samples which we encountered did in this case it was just uh, no the text itself didn't have any any real significance then, also in 2011, we spotted a campaign in Armenia. Uh, it dropped a decoy document which was legible. It was in, Ar in the Armenian language. What's, it, what's interesting about this one is that the used decoy is a legitimate document belonging 
to the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs in Armenia. Unfortunately, we don't know any, any other information about this case apart from this. Then in 2011, we saw, we saw a series of uh, campaigns uh, related to Triple M. For those of you that, that don't know what Triple M is, it's a financial pyramid, uh, one of the uh, most famous or infamous uh, Ponzi schemes of all time, very popular in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it was created by this guy, uh, Sergei Mavrodi. Uh, don't want to talk too much about it. If you're interested, you can read all about it on Wikipedia. Um, and the campaigns which were related to this, well, the first file which we spotted, uh, it wasn't obvious at first sight. The campaign ID uh, contained the string 00KM, so doesn't really translate to triple M. Uh, but the, the text in the decoy document was quite interesting. It said, hello, my name is Eugene something, my cell phone number, I am doing business in the construction industry and want, I want to invest about 500,000 rubles and I want to invest with the highest yield, hoping that you will help me. So this file was probably addressed uh, to an operator or members of, uh, of this pyramid scheme by someone. Another file, uh, which appeared just, just not long ago, not, not, not long later, uh, this time it contained a campaign ID triple ML, so the connection became more clear. Uh, the file name was uh, payment report for this lady here, and uh, the text in the decoy document, I don't know if anyone can, can decipher what that says, well, probably not, because it's apparently just a bunch of random Cyrillic uh, characters appearing as if the document was, was corrupted, even though it wasn't. And as you'll see later, documents such as this one uh, appear to be some sort of a trademark used by this uh, group. Uh, then we spotted something interesting. Uh, on, in June 2012, uh, the author of the Ponzi scheme, Sergei Mavrodi, uh, posted a blog where he's warned, where he said that somebody is trying to impersonate him and sending out uh, spam messages to members of uh, Triple M and spreading malware through, through uh, Dropbox. And that's precisely what we saw at that time. A uh, file called Anketa i Pravidla, meaning uh, uh, questionnaire and rules, uh, spreading through Dropbox, campaign ID N Triple M. Uh, then in October 2013, we saw a campaign in Georgia. Uh, the file name was a wedding invitation, and it was actually a wedding invitation. We detected it in Georgia, as I said. Uh, the text says that they're inviting you to celebrate their marriage in the restaurant in Europe. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that it was written in English. Uh, then, at the end of 2013, uh, we started noticing a shift from Russia and, and other former Soviet countries uh, towards Ukraine. Uh, at the end of 2013, we, s we detected quite a large number of uh, samples uh, which were debug versions of the malware. So they contain lots of uh, debugging information within them. Uh, the interesting thing in one of these is that they contain the campaign ID called Krim. And it was also detected in the Crimea region. Uh, as this these debugging samples were actually actually mass spreading, so they, they weren't uh, they weren't detected they were detected at lots of computers. Uh, such testing of uh, new versions of malware appears to be a pretty common technique used by used by APT operators before they actually uh, d use the malware in actual actual targeted campaigns. And those uh, targeted campaigns uh, followed a few months later. Uh, the spreading mechanism this time was different, however. It was not just, uh, not just uh, executables posing as Word documents. Instead, they used, again, a pretty typical uh, scenario. So claiming to be some sort of tracking information, for this purpose they registered uh, landing pages uh, such as this one, for example, MNT Express, a uh, po uh, fake postal website, and if somebody wanted to, well, somebody was led to download the malware. However, it was not possible for anyone to simply download it, but they needed to enter a specific, specific tra tracking number into this form before, before they were served the malware. Uh, 
this MNT Express website was pretty obviously uh, inspired by a legitimate uh, site called Pony Express. And that's a pretty typical spreading mechanism. Uh, however, in most cases, what the malware authors uh, or malware operators do is that they send out spear phishing emails with links towards such uh, landing pages. Uh, the Potao operators, however, they use a different approach and they, uh, they send out SMS messages to their, uh, to their potential victims. This is an indicator of uh, really high targeting because A, they had to know the full name. Well, they didn't, but they, did, but they not knew the full name and included in the text of the SMS. Uh, and they had to know the telephone number uh, of their victim. And they also tailored each, each sample uh, for that particular victim, sent them a unique tracking code uh, through which they were able to download that malware. Then also, uh, very, uh, the same scenario, uh, this time the site was called World Air Post, uh, looking like this, this is the fake one, inspired by a website uh, by Singapore Post. Uh, then, also from uh, attacking Ukrainian victims, uh, we spotted a couple of uh, very interesting attacks against high-profile targets. Uh, these targets were among uh, the Ukrainian government and military entities, and also one of the largest uh, Ukrainian uh, news agencies. Uh, the spreading mechanism was as in back, back in the old days of uh, Potao, so using executables with uh, word icons. And just similarly to what uh, the black energy operators did, they used uh, pretty interesting uh, file names to strike the curiosity uh, of the recipient and increase the likelihood that it, they would open uh, the attachment. For example, a uh, table of prisoners of Ukrainian armed forces on the 5th of March, or another one says a list of capture during the ATO, uh, ATO being the anti-terrorist uh, operation uh, in the, east of, in the east of Ukraine in the uh, crisis. And again, as I mentioned, some, somewhat of a trademark uh, by this group, uh, the uh, documents appeared corrupted, as you can see uh, in these couple of examples. Then during our research, we found out something particularly interesting. Uh, this was one detection of uh, Potao, it was detected under a uh, file name like this. The interesting part was that this file was created on the system uh, by TrueCrypt Exe. Now one possible explanation of, for this, of course, was that uh, you know, as malware usually uh, tries to uh, copy itself on the, on the system using innocuous uh, innocent looking uh, file names, so that was one, one possible explanation. However, we investigated Further, as it did catch our attention, uh, we found out that this TrueCrypt exe was created by an installer, TrueCrypt setup, and this installer was downloaded from a website called TrueCryptRussia.ru. So, looking at TrueCrypt Russia, we see a website which appears legit. Uh, you're able to download a uh, uh, localized uh, Russian translated version of TrueCrypt, it works, and in the largest number of cases, it will be clean. However, uh, in the largest amount of cases, in most cases, doesn't mean always. So when we looked at our telemetry of downloads from this particular domain, we saw uh, different, different uh, binaries being downloaded from, from this website. Uh, as you can see in this table, uh, some of them were clean, and there were a couple of different variants of, of a slightly modified, uh, modified TrueCrypt. Uh, in his Anthos part, in the technical, he'll explain uh, how the TrueCrypt uh, software was trojanized to include a backdoor. Uh, now, of course, there are several possible explanations for this. One is that it was, it was a website operated uh, by uh, the attackers, and they were doing it for quite, quite, quite a while. Another explanation is that, is that it was merely compromised by the attackers, and it, it was a legitimate website. Well, if we weigh in all these, all these points, so it was not only serving Trojanized TrueCrypt, it was also acting as a command and control server uh, for the backdoor. Uh, 
And the connection to Potao is even stronger. Not only did the backdoor within TrueCrypt download Potao, but it was, it was also, the website was also serving Potao itself. And it was doing this for, for quite a while. Uh, it was doing it very stealthily, and it, it was uh, selectively picking the victims to who uh, the backdoor would be served. Uh, and another interesting finding was that on the website, you're able to uh, click to a YouTube video that's basically an instruction video on how to, how to use uh, the popular in encryption software. So when we watched the video, we noticed something, something interesting. In the browser, uh, the author of the video had a, had a bookmark to FL, uh, one of the largest uh, Russian freelancer uh, job posting websites. And uh, it contained, it contained uh, text which is need to record vid. It was cut off. But look, we were lucky enough to find that posting, uh, that job offer. There were actually two of them. And uh, they basically contained the instructions on how to create the video. They included a link to TrueCrypt 71A, which is a legitimate uh, domain for TrueCrypt. However, this posting was there since 2013, and it was modified in March 2015, so almost two years later. And we were also able to uh, find out the original version of, uh, uh, of the posting. And guess which address guess which address that pointed to, truecrypt.ru. So uh, the open question, of course, remains, why would somebody go two years later trying to cover their tracks and change, change that address? So moving on to the technical part of the presentation, uh, first, a couple of detection statistics. Uh, as I said, the malware has been around for, at least for about five years. Uh, the reason why we started looking at was the increase in, uh, in the amounts of detections. Uh, in, this, in this diagram, you can see only the actual victims, the number of victims of the targeted campaign. So we excluded uh, the debugging version in 2013 and the mass spreading campaigns in 2011. Uh, and the reason for, for this increase in 2014 uh, was the introduction of a new spreading mechanism. So to summarize it, the different kinds of spreading me mechanisms which we have uh, observed uh, throughout our research was the masquerading at ex executables as, uh, as Word documents. We also saw Excel documents and PDFs uh, spread through a variety of uh, ways. Also, some, some as, you, as you can see here, uh, also a very interesting uh, USB spreading mechanism. So it didn't use the, the old auto run inf trick, but it instead used something uh, quite clever. Uh, if there were any files in the root directory of uh, the USB drive, it would mark them as hidden. It would copy, copy itself uh, to that drive uh, using an icon of, of a remo removable drive, and uh, the file name uh, would, be, would be set according to the label of that USB drive. So uh, when some, some victim opened this, uh, they were very easily fooled into you know, clicking this, thinking that they would they would open that USB drive while they were running the malware. And of course, there was the Trojan TrueCrypt and possibly other uh, methods which we have not seen. And now it's Anton's turn. So the malware consists of two components, the dropper and the uh, dropper DLL. Uh, the dropper creates DLL file and executes by run DLL32. It writes it to a standard registry key, but interesting part here that before dropping, it changed some export function of uh, this DLL. So on every different computer, uh, it, the DLL file will be unique. We think it, it is some kind of uh, bypass of cloud protection or something like that. So, when executed, it injects itself into two types of processes. Uh, one instance is to be injected to uh, processes that uh, use internet connection, and this instance is uh, responsible for communication with uh, 
CNC server and another instance is injected to Explorer XZ. And this instance is responsible for running plugins. And these two instances, they talk each other with, with each other via pipe. And uh, CNC communication, it uses strong crypto. And here is an example of uh, decrypted data. It sends to CNC server uh, ID, campaign ID, version of operation system, version of malware, computer name, process name, and so on. And it encrypts this data and uh, it encapsulates it into a protocol that looks like XML RPC. Here is a, an example. And uh, in this example, you can see there is two static parts that, uh, that we observed during our monitoring. Uh, winter task, this URL part is always the same. And uh, method call, method name, and followed constant is always the, the is same in Patao traffic. So uh, here is examples of possible uh, commands. Uh, it doesn't have so many commands, so it's uh, just downloader. It can download plugin or executable. So, and here is an uh, example of plugins that we observed during our monitoring. Uh, it is possible that this list is not uh, full. It's possible that we missed something, but it, it is what we saw. So plugins are not stored on, on the disk. And there is two types of plugins. Light plugin, it means that it collects some information and it returns uh, collected data to a core model and full plugin. It means that it runs uh, continuously and uh, it communicates with uh, CNC server by himself. So it, it means that it might uh, contain a different CNC server than core model. So, and by looking on this list, you can see that it is, uh, the functionality is pretty much what you expect from this kind of backdoor. So, first plugin, it collects browsing history of various browsers. Second uh, plugin, it, it has the same name, but functionality is different. It collects information about system, uh, password stealer uh, collects uh, password from, for following applications. Uh, key logger injects itself to following uh, process name and collects key strokes. And here is example of uh, code for screen.dll plugin. This plugin grabs screenshot of desktop. So as you can see, it just makes screenshot. It converts binary data to base 64, and it returns re result to core component. Uh, file path stealer, this plugin just collects information about files, but it do doesn't steal files it's itself. And this plugin. It actually steals uh, files, so it used for data exfiltration. Um, so let's talk about fake TC. It is completely different malware. So it, it is not Patao. It is TrueCrypt. It looks like TrueCrypt. It works like TrueCrypt but it has some uh, additional feature. So when user uh, mounts his uh, encrypted drive, it activates some backdoor functionality. 
and uh, when this backdoor is activated, it connects to CNC server, and it gets uh, some of these commands. So it is, as we can see, it's fully featured espionage Trojan. It can uh, collect data, collect files on encrypted drive. It can steal file. It can steal password. It can download and execute file. Um, so, and this backdoor fun functionality, it is um, something that uh, uh, pretty stealthy. So, this back backdoor functionality is activated only when certain criteria is met. And this criteria is uh, victims encrypted drive should contain more than 10 files, and this drive should mo mount it more than four times. So they have the, uh, long term to encrypt users. So, and this is probably the reason why uh, this malware has been undetected for so long. Here is comparison with other malware. We, last year we presented Black Energy. Most uh, targeted country was also Ukraine. But there is something interesting. We found out that in Patao plugin there is some typo. And this typo is in code that collects information about uh, proxy. And same type typo we found in the top code. So we checked, and this typo is uh, unique. We checked a lot of mal malware fi uh, files, and we found out that this typo exists, as you can see, uh, in only in two uh, malwares, in Zartop and Patao. And the reason why I show you this, that we think that there is some code reuse between Zortop and Patao. Uh, what is Zortop? Zortop is um, uh, Trojan, that well known. It spreads itself via spam, and it also uses RSA for uh, encryption, but the thing is that it's um, different. So we cannot say that it was caught by some group, but we have seen some code reuse. And this botnet is notorious for uh, spreading m m messages, uh, masquerading themselves as uh, partial deliveries, f for example, as this one. And if you click on that button, get post up receipt, you uh, will get uh, a file. And here is also similarity in naming scheme. We observed following uh, file names for Patao and Zartop. And interesting part here, that when you are trying to download something, server will rename this executable based on geo, geo, uh, geo location of victim. So if you are downloading file from London, you will get file, voicemail, London. So, Robert. Okay, so to sum it all up, I think that was a very interesting uh, piece of malware, malware family uh, that has gone unnoticed for, for quite a number of years. Uh, the operation themselves were quite interesting. The technical aspects were also quite interesting. Uh, I guess it begs the obvious question, who's behind it? Uh, we don't really do speculation about attribution. Uh, who is trying to spy on members of, of a pyramid scheme? and at the same time spying against uh, Ukrainian high-value government targets and spying on people who are encrypting files uh, on their computer. Uh, the only, only things which have a, we have observed, some clues, is that the malware authors were probably uh, Russian-speaking, 
Uh, and that's pretty much it. If you're, if you're interested in this topic, we released a white paper about it where you can read more details. And I'm not sure if we have time for questions. If not, then we'll be available. I think we should be good with one question or two. Anyone? What is the current state of uh, detection of this malware by the, uh, uh, well, anti-malware products that are out there? They detected? I mean, the, the others. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's detected by, by other, other uh, AV vendors as well. So, um, yeah, but it hasn't received that much, that much attention yet. There's one. I think they use Winter 2 API and they also collect data from registry. Okay, so I think our time ran up, so uh, let's thank the guys for the great research. I'm sure they will be around for some more questions. <laughs>